The order came through, prepare to abandon ship. Prepare to abandon ship. Hands to abandon ship stations. And so I went for it. And, you know, the ship was slewed over about 45 degrees to starboard. And I went forward on the starboard side. And I went up a hatch. And it was a job to get up. And when I went on deck, all the bodies were lying about. And the gun was on its side. There was a pile of bodies. And of course I nipped aft as best I could. And I went on my position. And the boat was in the crutches. And when I tried to get it, to lift it, the crutches were pushing against it. And I couldn't release it. And once the officer in charge had realised what, ha what was happening, him and I discussed it. He said, well, we can't do anything, so we'll have to go back to action stations. So I left the winch and went forward again. I wanted to give one ladder... He was lying there and he had both his legs off, you know, from the waist down. And I said to him, he was a Marine, and I said to him, I'll, I'll give you a hand to get a, a, a overboard. He, and he said to him, no, no, son, he said, uh, leave me here. I'm not going home like this. <laughs> And I, I said, well, come on. No, he said, no, I'm not going home like this. And that was the last I seen of him. Well, my abandoned ship station was on the lower flying off deck, right up forward. It was on the level with the top hangar. In the olden days, or before my time, they used to fly the aircraft straight out from the top hangar and away, instead of taking them up to the flight deck. <clears throat> so anyway, I made myself way way along the um, starboard boat deck and all the guns crews along there was all killed around the, around the guns and I got to the this uh, flying off deck where there was a number of Carly rafts stowed down um, and then they piped action stations again. Well, I couldn't see much point in going all the way back to where I'd come from. So, uh, but it was only a few minutes later and then they, they piped abandoned ship stations again. And after a, about an hour, or perhaps a little less, the ship began to list very badly. We were still doing quite a good forward speed, some 12, 15 knots, but uh, began to list badly, and we were zigzagging, um, and I thought that she would roll over, the, she had such a list on, and then eventually the order was given to abandon ship. And Carly floats were thrown over the side um, for the crew and us passengers to swim to. So when they dropped a, a, a float from the uh, uh, quarter deck, I had my May West on. I went over the side, came up like a cork, swam about 10 yards and scrambled above aboard the uh, uh, Carly float. Well, I got over the side of the ship and climbed down the side, and uh, the glory she, she had 
bulges on the side of her, down the bottom, like, you know, well, of course, you could stand on them. And then, of course, she waited there until you jumped in the water, that was all. A lot of fellas just jumped in the water from the top deck, you know. They're jumping all over the place. Because you had to get off her, she was hopeless, I mean, she just burning. You see, she was a big ship, the Glorious. She was well out of the water, you know, she was high up. And when you got away from the ship, when you're swimming away from her, you look back, you could see fellas trying to get off her. You know, in lifeboats. And the lifeboats couldn't be lowered. And I thought, well, if this ship capsizes, I, I wouldn't be able to do a thing. So, the hatch, the manhole, and what a job I had. I really, I think it, it was the most horrible thing that ever happened to me, reaching for that manhole and trying to keep my feet on the top part of the ladder, which was straight. But I, eventually I got through, and uh, I went to the side of the, the ship, and of course it, this, the port side was up like that. The side, you could look straight, sloting down, you know. And there was a boat there, a power boat, not a cutter, but a power boat. And um, it was full of men. And they were all bandaged and that sort of thing. And they were all face napped. And just waiting. And I noted, noticed the blisters. Um, the boat was resting between the ship's side and the bulge on the ballast tank. Full of men. And of course it was impossible to, to, to push it over the top of the ballast tank. So it was impossible for that boat to ever get away. So I um, got a hold of a lifeline. And of course I blew my life belt up. Got a hold of the lifeline and slid into the water. Cut these uh, carly ruffs adrift and put them over the side. We couldn't get them over the port side, which we should have done really, because of the angle of the deck was ship was listing over and it was on fire from stem to stern and the um, so we put them over the starboard side and the ship was still underway and after we put the last one over I took my boots off and I dived over from the and I'd blown my life jacket. It was a breast type one. It wasn't one that like a belt went right round. It was just a, a breast type. And I dived over and it seemed an awful long way down. But when I hit the water, I uh, tumbled over a few times under the water, I think. And I came up. And when I came up, it was all smoke and sting from the ship as it was still moving by. So I couldn't see anything. But eventually, as it passed, away in the distance, when I was on top of a wave, I could see a Carly raft. The sea was plenty of men in the water. Any, uh, you know, as far as you know, I could see, like, trying to make somewhere to get hold of, you know. Well, there was no boats or anything. It was gone, or they, they were gone. There was plenty of rafts. But the rafts were in the distance. They, they must have got away earlier than what we did. I could see the, the raft, one raft in the area, and I, I put my mind to that. We eventually made that raft uh, after quite a swim, and I eventually found it. So I, I hung on, just on a rope, Finally, I got a place on the raft. Uh, I was inside standing up for ages. And eventually, they made room by some people dying. Oh, it was really cool. So I kicked my 
Wellingtons off. I kicked them off. I didn't just kick them off. I had to pull them off and swallow a lot of water and, you know, and pushing them and pushing them and until they dropped out. I swam around and w I saw some bits of um, flotsam just astern of the ship and also some heads bobbing around. And I got those off and then I made a positive swim to the stern where I mixed with these other lads, survivors. And um, one, one or two had froth run down their face. And I thought, oh, they must be in a terrible state for that to happen. The salt water's got into their lungs and everything to make that. So I, I just kept on bobbing and keep me. And, you know, you, you see a wave coming and you stop breathing for a moment. Let it flop over you and then start breathing again. And I, I had to do that all the time. And then I saw a raft. And I thought, this is my chance so I swam towards it, and it was chock-a-block with men. I swam about 50 yards to get on it, away from the ship, you see. And the raft went past the stern and away, and was getting further and further away when I, I more, more or less chased after it, swimming. It was a big Carly float, you know, the big type. It was full. There was standing in the centre... And the, the raft was underwater. There were so many men on it. And I made, they were watching me swim towards them. And they made room. Just a little space, about 14 inches, you know, just a little bit of room. And they made room and I had difficulty in getting aboard. But they give us a hand. One fella sitting next and this side. Um, they helped us, and I managed to get in and sit down where the space had been made. That was part of the reason why I lived, I think. I just went over the side and I just swam away. I, I couldn't see for anything to swim for, really. And then uh, I, I swam for about two hours. You see, well, there was nothing to swim for, really. Some fellas were lucky and they got a boat, you know, and some but some got in carly floats. There were so many bodies and fellas swimming along in the water, you know, and uh, some were just dying. You know, they just died with the cold. And uh, I eventually saw this carny float. And I swam towards it. And then when I got, I got to the carny float, I got inside it. Because it was chock-a-block. There was about, I'm not sure, about 60 men inside it. They were all stood up. We drifted away from the ship. And the ship started to go down. More so than before. Still lots of smoke coming out, but I would suggest that most of that smoke belching out came from the hangars, not from the engine room or anything like that. I must put this in now because of those two destroyers. The first destroyer wasn't in sight, so I presume the Ardent had been sunk by then. But the Acasta was hiding. Be I say hiding. It looked that way hiding behind the Glorious. And when the Glorious got lower and lower and was just about to disappear, the Acasta came out and went straight for these two battleships and start firing, firing and everything. And I thought it was a wonderful sight that. And then of course we drifted away. And I never saw the Acasta struck, but uh, we were trying to keep alive, I suppose. The two destroyers, the Acasta and the Ardent, 
One went out to engage the uh, German battleships and the other one laid a smoke screen around us because we'd been hit and we were crippled a bit. And when the smoke screen cleared, we didn't see sign of either destroyer. So one must have been sunk while she was laying the smoke screen and the other one had been sunk while she went out to engage. Then the two German battleships uh, came up. I didn't know at that time that they were the Scharnhorst and the Neisenar, but that's what they were. And reluctantly, I took these papers which I had got in my pocket about the squadron's operations in Norway, I took them out and threw them in the water because I was quite sure that we were going to be picked up uh, by the Germans and I was not going to give them any information about our, our operation. However, the two, two ships steamed up, did not stop, and went straight on. And within a quarter of an hour, we were alone. 40 miles inside the Arctic Circle and about 200 miles off Norway. And, and what we didn't know, of course, was that one of the destro escorting destroyers, either the Ardent or the Castor, had fired a torpedo which had hit one of these ships. And therefore, all they were interested in was making harbour uh, as quickly as they could, so they didn't. They didn't stop at all. They didn't pick anybody up. There was hundreds of women, hundreds. You know, it, it, honestly, God, I, I can't understand why there was no nobody came to search for us or look for us or anything. You know, I mean, the two destroyers that were with us, all they were trying to do was make a smoke signal up for, you know, a smoke screen for us to get away, you know, so they couldn't do anything like, you know. And then, of course, then they went for the uh, Neisner, you know, and of course they, <laughs> that was a waste of time too because they just blew them out of the water. You knew where they were, like, you know, you could see them firing, but... They weren't close at all. And uh, they didn't bother about picking anybody up or anything. Just didn't bother. Which I thought was a bit mean, really. I mean, normally, <laughs> if you do anything like that at sea, you, you do try to look after the survivors that are in the water at all, like, you know. But no, they weren't interested. <laughs> 